Welcome back, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Derek Brower, the FT's US Energy Editor. I'm in New York, uh, so anybody joining me on this side of the Atlantic, uh, welcome. Uh, one person who is, and I'm delighted is joining us, is the United States Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, for the conference's last session. Truly leaving the best to last, I think. Yeah, uh, before we that. begin, <laughs> a, a note of housekeeping. Please, um, any questions that you have, uh, for Madam Secretary, please send them in using the box, chat box on the right of your screen. And second, if you want to tweet about this, please use the hashtag FTEnergyTran. Uh, Madam Secretary, welcome. Um, let's begin. Um, if I could, I'd like to start with Europe because a lot of our audience is there. There's an energy crisis underway, as you know, in Europe. Gas and electricity prices are at historic highs. Do you blame Russia for this? Um. Well, we're certainly watching it. I'll say this. Um, I um, just got back from Poland and met with a number of the Eastern and Central European countries. And there was a, a deep concern that there was uh, withholding of supplies and manipulation of the market in order to demonstrate, if you will, the indispensability of Russian gas as Germany considers its Nord Stream 2 approvals. However, I. I don't have information to say that that is the case. We are watching it very carefully. Obviously, the U.S. Uh, wants to make sure, and and it's you know there is a ripple effect in the United States as well. We are seeing natural gas prices um, shoot up uh, also. But um, uh, so we have we are undergoing a process internally to the federal government, just so that you know, to look at this issue and to make sure that we're doing all we can both here and uh, in Europe to ensure that people have the supplies they need. Mm -hmm. Do you, does that include the possibility of investigating market manipulation by Gazprom as the Polish government has called for? Um, well, I know the Polish government was very uh, concerned about that as well. Suffice it to say, we're aware of the request. We're aware of the um, fact that there does seem to be, what well, I say, a choke point um, and not as much supply. But um, there are also, I understand, um, and it's true in the United States too, this ramp up after COVID takes a little bit more time than people would like, given how quickly um, winter is emerging. And it is projected to be a bit of a colder winter. So. Um, there are those issues. Just uh, let me just say that we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. It sounds, I mean, those are fairly moderate comments. It sounds like you're trying to cool some of the rhetoric because some of your uh, colleagues in, in Europe are talking about this as an energy war almost. Another, We're, we're in the grip of another energy war. Do you fear yeah. that it could spiral into that? I worry about that, certainly. I mean, you don't want to see um, energy made into a weapon. And I, the weaponization of, um, of energy is a serious problem. I'm not saying that that is happening right now. I am saying that we understand the concerns and that given the uh, enormous jack up in prices, there deserves to be special eyes on it. And we are looking at it. But uh, at the moment, we don't have a conclusion on that. Is there anything you think the U.S. can do on the supply side, for example, to help? And I ask because the previous administration, as you know, talked of freedom, gas and so on, helping to break Europe's dependence uh, on Russian gas. Should the U.S. or can the U.S. send more gas right now? Most of the cargoes that are sold in the spot market seem to be bought by Asia right now and the market is sucking them in one direction and they're not arriving in Europe. Is there something more that the U.S. can do to help relieve Europe? You know, again, we have an um, interagency process looking at this. I mean, you know, as you know, and as Europe knows, I mean, we are in a position where we 
preside over a free market. And so we don't own the means of supply and we don't own uh, the ability to direct. And so the question is, mm -hmm. what are the tools at our disposal to make sure that there is supply that's adequate, uh, both for Europe as well as for the United States? I will say that our um, LNG supply uh, at this moment is almost to the to the cap of the existing capacity. So um, it is, it, you'd have to build out, even though um, new, ter new, uh, new terminals are authorized, they have not been built out yet. It would take obviously some time for that to happen um, to jack up additional supplies. So it is, uh, it's, it's not as obvious as a, of a solution as one might otherwise think. The capacity limits are almost reached. Mm -hmm. Let me stay with the international market and ask about oil prices because uh, w WTI, uh, West Texas Intermediate, the US benchmark is near $80, uh, Brent is above $80, levels that some economists say will start to slow the recovery, the economic recovery from the pandemic. The administration has expressed its alarm about gasoline prices and uh, President Biden has talked about them. Uh, do you think OPEC is doing enough? Last week they met, or earlier this week they met, and after the U.S. asked for more supply, they stuck to their existing plan. Are they? Is the OPEC group of producers, OPEC Plus, are they doing enough to cool what could be a damaging oil price rally? Well, I think that everybody was hoping that there would be additional supply made available so that prices would not be jacked up. Um, and the president, President Biden, has made it clear that he wants Americans to have access to affordable and reliable energy, obviously at the pump, but natural gas too. Um, mm -hmm. The administration really is committed to doing everything we can to make sure that everybody's paying, that Americans are paying um, fair and affordable gas prices. Um, you know, we, the tools, this is a similar art, a similar problem, right? We do not, we are, we don't own our own gas supply or oil supply. Uh, and so the market is what the market is. Presidents don't control the cost of gasoline. And we also are aware that we want to move into a clean energy environment and that we want, um, while this transition occurs, we want for people to not bear the cost of that in terms of at the pump. I and mean, the president, even in deciding on how to pay for his big agenda uh, in Congress, he made it clear that raising gas taxes, for example, is not on the table. He drew a red line uh, for that. So he he does not want to raise costs on everyday people for anything. And so mm -hmm. while we go through this uh, transition, he wants to incentivize the development of clean technologies and clean fuel supplies um, without having have everyday citizens pay for the cost of that. Mm -hmm. And the White House has said that all tools, I think Jen Psaki said this earlier this week, all tools are on the on the yeah. table in terms of trying to deal with this uh, price surge. Does that include um, releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, for example? It, yep, it's a tool for sure. And is that a, a possibility in the next coming in the coming weeks? Well, it's it's a tool that's under consideration. Um, you know, there are regularly scheduled sales already set, uh, mm -hmm. so. Ooh. Uh, a regularly scheduled sales set. So that might provide some, but again, it's very much marginal assistance overall, given this, the scope of the, of the problems, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that is a tool and certainly the president will consider that. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly restricting exports. Is that also on the table? Um, that's a tool that we have not used, um, but mm -hmm. it is a tool as well. And as I say, we're, we have an, uh, an intergovernmental process that is going on. And, um, you know, as Jen Saki said, all tools are on the table, but, um, you know, some, some are more readily available than others. Okay. Um, let me turn to the U.S. now and ask about, um, and we'll stick with oil for a sec, oil and gas. Uh, U.S. producers, shale producers, as you know, um, say these price rises are the outcome of policies from the Biden administration. In particular, they cite the moratorium on uh, leasing of federal lands for, for fracking. Um, do you think producers are, uh, in the US should be doing more to increase production right now uh, well, themselves? 
let's be clear that um, the moratorium was on new leases and there were a whole lot of existing leases that were not even being used um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that were available, that are available uh, to be able to be uh, taken advantage of. You know, we want to see supply and demand uh, be at a place where we don't see huge increases in prices. So I'll just leave it at that. And the president is very concerned about that. Okay. Um, let me turn to Congress. Uh, the president has been uh, adamant that his sweeping clean energy agenda will go ahead. Uh, these are huge plans, as we all know, and as we've discussed a lot in this conference. And his agenda rests on Congress's approval of these plans uh, later this uh, this month, potentially, or when the vote comes in the coming weeks. You've been following the the uh, the machinations and the debate in Congress closely, of course, um, and are very familiar with what's happening. What do you think is likely, uh, not what you want to come out of this process, but what do you think is likely now to emerge from Congress in terms of you know, how much of the 3.5 trillion dollar reconciliation package, how much of the 1.2 uh, trillion dollar um, bipartisan infrastructure bill, how much of these packages will survive by the time Congress is done with them? Yeah, I mean, as you're aware, the bipartisan infrastructure deal will largely stay intact, I predict, and I think that um, that's um, pretty clear. It's just a question of the size of the Build Back Better, uh, the second piece, the Build Back Better agenda. Um, you're aware, of course, that the president um, spoke with members of his party over the past couple of days and told them that they would have to pare down the ambition. And so whether the real question is whether they uh, pare everything back or whether they put um, certain categories off to the side and fund others fully. Um, I know that even just as I was coming on to this call, I saw uh, Senator Manchin describing what he thought were his priorities, and he has a pretty um, big say in how this is shaped. So um, I do think that, it, you know, th combined, this is still going to be a huge investment in our nation. And in, you know, from my column of the world in the Department of Energy, it is going to be a huge investment in technologies and in projects and in a grid deployment authority that really takes us to the next level and knocks down a lot of the barriers that we have seen in the past. So I, you know, the issue really comes down to, quite honestly, whether there will be this clean electricity performance program or some version of it that incentivizes mm -hmm. utilities to do the build out and has both incentives and penalties and goals. And so is it the uh, CEPP, as we call it, or is it something uh, that's that's got those elements? Uh, that is part of what the last bit of negotiation is to occur. I think there will be um, a consensus around the investment in tax credits to incentivize the build out of clean energy. Um, we have been um, eager to incentivize all kinds of clean energy, uh, clean broadly defined. That uh, includes obviously wind and solar and renewables, uh, but it also includes decarbonization of fossil fuels. It would include nuclear. So we are, um, you know, I, I continue to say this is about silver buckshot, not a silver bullet to incentivize all of those in the way that this bill uh, does, I think will be enormous for America and enormous for the movement forward of these technologies. And most importantly, from the president's perspective, is jobs in this overall sector. It's not just mm -hmm. one industry. It is a sector uh, that includes a whole slew of industries that provides jobs for people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll come to jobs in a sec. Let me just, uh, if I may, um, ask a couple of follow-ups. So does the silver buckshot, does that include natural gas in the CEPP? Because uh, it seems that that may be a sticking point for Senator Manchin. If the CEPP can include natural gas, or broadly defined, if natural gas can be included in a clean energy package, he may approve it. Would you be happy for natural gas to be in the CEPP? Uh, natural gas with carbon capture technology, yes. 
Um, I will say that the Senator, Senator Manchin has been a huge advocate, as have a number of decarbonization technologies like carbon capture and sequestration. Mm -hmm. And so presumably then if natural gas with carbon capture could be in it, coal with carbon capture could also be in it? Yeah, I mean, part of the, uh, you know, decarbonization is decarbonization. And so, right. um, you know, the question for coal has been, does it pencil out? But the, um, you know, the CEPP provides the means to build out that technology. And that's what it funds. It doesn't fund shareholder profits. It funds the build out of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And we want to take these technologies to scale. It's not this, just the U.S., that is looking at these uh, decarbonization strategies. So mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, we want to prove it out. Part of the infrastructure bill that was passed includes carbon capture and um, clean hydrogen hubs, demonstration hubs. So, you know, we want to take it to scale so that we can reduce the cost of it so that it can be one of the pieces of buckshot that's in our goal of clean dispatchable baseload power. Right. Um, and just to be clear, so a new new natural gas fired power station with CCS could be part could of a be. utilities program. Could be. OK. Um, let me ask about jobs, because uh, I know, as you, as you said, this is very dear to the administration and President Biden's agenda for clean energy. Um, nonetheless, the, the, the pushback from some people in the traditional fossil fuel jobs is that clean energy jobs are less reliable, uh, less long term, lower pay. Um, frankly, they come with higher risks and some of the skills aren't necessarily transferable in the way that uh, some people claim. How do you, how, how important do you think it is, first of all, for these communities in fossil fuel areas of Wyoming and you know, non-Democrat voting areas of the country, frankly, to be brought alongside or to brought in, be brought in, you know, along while you, you push this energy transition? Or do you just think that some of these will essentially be casualties of a, of a necessary shift? Yeah, this is a great question and hear me loud and clear. The president doesn't want to leave anyone behind and he feels very strongly that these communities in particular, he has a whole Justice 40 initiative and that Justice 40 initiative um, and the focus on coal and power plant communities and the focus on communities that have been left behind because they have perhaps been located in, in the shadows of smokestacks and have uh, disproportionate amounts of asthma, et cetera, both types of communities, just transition communities and uh, justice 40 communities are going to be part of our place-based strategy for, for targeted focus on investments. We have not as, um, we have not really had that before. I mean, other countries have, Europe has, but we have not really focused uh, as much as we should have on these transitioning communities. I tell you the reason why I think the president asked me to be secretary of energy is because I was governor of Michigan and we ha we were in that situation. Our main product was a, is a product that uses fossil fuels with an internal combustion engine. And so we saw our industry on its knees through the Great Recession. And a lot of that was the Great Recession compounded by the fact that we saw a lot of imports um, that were much more fuel efficient, honestly, Japanese imports, et cetera. And people were expressing a preference. And so we had to make a decision. And this is why the president is so key on this because during the Recovery Act, they funneled money to Michigan to help us diversify into areas that we knew we could be competitive in, including car 2.0, which is the electric vehicle and the guts to that vehicle, which is the electric vehicle battery. So that, mm -hmm. that experience, and now of course, Michigan, um, is on the rebound, the electric vehicles. We, you know, you saw all of, I know we're going to have a, you want to have a separate conversation about vehicles, but I just have to say this is right near and dear to me. And the president, the point is that the president sees that example and sees what's happening in these coal and power plant communities and says, we can offer them an ability to diversify. I say this to Senator Manchin all the time. West Virginia powered this country for a hundred years on coal. They can power our country for the next hundred years, but using clean energy. And we can figure out what are the technologies that are consonant with the tech, the experience and the skill set of the workers there. So, so do they have expertise in subsurface? Yeah, let's look at the hotspots in West Virginia for geothermal. Let's give people the ability to attach 
carbon capture and sequestration technologies to existing power plants. Let's make sure we have hydrogen, clean hydrogen hubs. And that, by the way, might require the ability to lay pipe underground to move carbon, et cetera. So there are tons of skills in this clean energy world that are good skills, including, I mean, the Senator Manchin would love to put nuclear on top of coal plants like they just did in Wyoming, Terra Power mm -hmm. funded by mm -hmm. Bill Gates just put uh, or is um, slated to put a coal plant, excuse me, a, a nuclear, small nuclear yeah. reactor adjacent to a coal plant. That is a huge opportunity, good paying jobs, union jobs. So there's, you know, we do not want to leave any community behind. We are not going to leave any community behind and we're going to direct investments into those communities. Okay, let me ask about cars. Um, Ford and SK Innovation recently announced this huge uh, $11 billion investment plan to build assembly and battery plants in Tennessee and Kentucky, and there's this big EV rollout that they're planning there. Um, do you see that region of the country? Is Tennessee about to become the kind of EV, uh, the Detroit of EVs? I don't say that to me. I'm still, I mean, I am good for Tennessee. But I, still, yeah. I mean, I have my home team, you know, but honestly, I mean, there's enough love to go around. I mean, we want to see these investments in batteries in the United States and the supply chain for those batteries, the anode, the cathode, the separator material, the electrolyte, those are all separate companies, different kinds of investments. We want them all in the U.S. And that includes, by the way, responsible extraction of lithium and cobalt and, you know, the materials that go into those batteries. And we don't do that as much in the United States, very few places we end up importing. And that's true with processing those materials. We don't have a single processing facility in the United States. One of the reasons why the president has focused on the battery supply chain to be able to get the whole value chain associated with electric vehicles in the United States. And I'm sure Tennessee wants it, Michigan wants it, Georgia wants it, they all want it and you know, good, let's compete. Okay. Um let me ask a question about infrastructure and energy infrastructure in particular. There was obviously a huge focus from the administration on infrastructure, full stop, period. Uh, but the energy infrastructure seems to be particularly thorny um, matter for this energy transition, because as you know, transmission lines need to cross states and, and some of the permitting for this is difficult. I, I spoke to an offshore wind developer who talked about starting the permitting process in 2007 and only getting approval for it um, last year. So. Uh, but this, the problem is not just on clean energy either. Pipeline uh, developers say that they can't get approvals. And, and we saw the vulnerabilities when the Colonial Pipeline went down um, earlier this year of the U.S. energy you know, consumer to the vulnerabilities in the energy infrastructure system in the U.S. How, does, how can you, how does the federal government fix this problem, speed up yeah. this process so that this isn't hindering the transition or, or even hindering energy security? Yeah, it's a this is a great question. I mean, the permitting for some of these projects, especially on the transmission side, uh, it is just you know when it, any type of infrastructure that runs across multiple states is going to be onerous. But there are steps that we're taking to help clear the um, obstacles to approval. I hear more about it on the transmission side. So, I mean, for one thing, here's an example. The Department of Energy already has authority over public highways and other rights of way, public lands, where we can site and permit new transmission lines quickly. And so if we can use those existing rights of way and create and just put them up in easements, that's fantastic. Earlier in the year, um, I know the Department of Transportation issued new guidelines on how to leverage these um, rights of way, public rights of way for high priority transmission projects. And by the way, to serve as a model for private partners like railroads to do the same. And uh, part of that infrastructure as well is building out the infrastructure for electric vehicles. And so you can imagine a combination of perhaps transmission, EV build outs uh, along public rights of way, which um, lessens the resistance, uh, of course, since it is on public land. You know, Congress clearly wants us to uh, address these bottlenecks too. And so the, that bipartisan infrastructure deal includes a new grid deployment authority, which would let us uh, at DOE designate corridors of national interests along those existing uh, rights of way, allowing for uh, quicker construction and would allow DOE to take a, um, a position 
on a proposed transmission line, because as you know, transmission lines are not built on spec. Usually you have to have offtake. And if we see it as an important one, um, that we would take a position potentially to do that offtake so that they can then uh, afford the, the build out and the surety that they will be able to have that offtake. Um, DOE and the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, they we both have roles in getting projects uh, permitted and we meet every other week uh, to make sure that we are in sync and aligned uh, to be able to move faster. You know, and then on the oil and gas side, you know, obviously we need to invest in uh, infrastructure that's going to help us build our clean energy economy. And while we still, you know, we, we obviously will also have pipelines into the future and we want to make sure those pipelines are um, leak free, particularly natural gas pipelines mm -hmm. as we're concerned about methane emissions and there will be more on that uh, as you're probably aware but that's over in the EPA mm -hmm. side of things we also though want to continue to build out the infrastructure for the clean side uh, and emphasize that as well and I see that I'm bumping up against time I'm so sorry about that uh, I may have to jump uh, off at this Thank moment you. Uh, but I really appreciate the chance to have a conversation thanks for the smart questions Madam Secretary thank you very much you bet. Uh, that is it from the FT Live Energy Transition Summit. It's been a provocative uh, two days, I think. Um, the consensus from my panels and the ones I listened to was that transition, energy transition to a cleaner energy future is, is well underway and is probably irreversible. Uh, the market is moving in that direction. Policy now needs to follow more quickly, too, to support it. Um, but there will, I think, uh, this came up repeatedly, there will be dislocations caused by this transition and involved in this transition. And these need to be addressed. In particular, there are gaps in the technology that need to be filled. That was clear from a number of uh, panel discussions. And there are fossil fuel communities that cannot be left behind. And we just heard uh, the Secretary of Energy in the United States talk about that. Uh, these are hard questions and um, probably need more than what uh, Greta Thunberg describes as blah, blah, blah from politicians and their bromides. Um, that's certainly not what we just heard from the Secretary of Energy. Uh, I was delighted with that conversation. Um, I am, I have been intrigued uh, to hear in a lot of the panel discussions, and I think some of my other uh, moderators at the FT have felt the same way, um, the view that the fossil fuel supply crisis that is underway now, uh, soaring prices for fossil fuels, will not um, slow this energy transition, but will actually accelerate it. Uh, those are my kind of concluding thoughts. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, thank you to the excellent green room and backroom staff who made all this happen, uh, the planners and so on. Thank you to our lead sponsors, Baker Hughes, Chevron, EY, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group, Oliver Wyman, uh, to our associate sponsors, ANSYS, AXPO, Blackstone, Fuel Cell Energy, Lundin Energy, National Grid and Worley. Thanks also to our supporting organizations, Bioenergy Europe, International Solar Alliance, Euroelectric, Gas Naturally, and Commodities Trading Association. Um, everyone who's still here, do remember you can watch these videos from the conference uh, on demand for the next 90 days at energy.live.ft.com. Uh, and finally, I look forward to seeing everyone, I hope in person for a change, at the FT Energy Source Live US edition in Houston in early April with a date, an exact date to be confirmed soon. See you there and thank you for being here.